Hello everyone, this is Kat and welcome back to My Hero Academia Podfix. This will be the continuation of UA Survival Guide. This will be Part 45, Chapter 45. It takes some time for Shoto to wrap his head around everything he'd learned between Izuku and Yagi. What was said in that conference room, that was scary. Those were the kinds of secrets that you need time to process. He may have been able to force a calmness into his body language and expression when sat in the room with the two of them, but that doesn't mean that he wasn't internally panicking. It really was a lot to take in, a lot to swallow so suddenly, without any warning. It was surprising and seemingly impossible. A quirk that could be passed on from person to person sounded like something out of fairy tales. Izuku being the ninth inheritor of said quirk, Izuku receiving a quirk from the number one hero when he was just fifteen years old, meeting All Might and being promised the quirk when he was only fourteen. Shota understands the secrecy, to a certain degree, at least. He understands the confidentiality that Izuku had been thrust into regarding such a dangerous secret and interacting with a famous man who'd kept this secret since his start of his own hero career thirty years ago. He respects the attempt at trying to keep the kids safe and protecting such a vital secret that absolutely has the power to upturn society if it got out that something like that even so much as existed, but that doesn't mean that Yagi hadn't been stupid about it. Passing a quirk like that on to a teenager, essentially a child, and not offering anything to help. Shota knows the pro well enough to know that he'd been trying to help Izuku, but Yagi simply doesn't have the training to be a quirk counselor or properly guide Izuku through quirk training, whether he possessed the dangerous quirk or not. Experience won't get you so far, especially when it comes to the unpredictability of quirks. Still, he understands, but that doesn't mean that he isn't gutted to finally learn the truth. To be let in on a secret that he should have been told about the moment that Izuku was placed into his class, years behind in quirk control than any of the other students. He was supposed to protect these kids, to help them grow and learn, and teach them how to be good people, let alone how to be good heroes in today's society. He was supposed to be there for the students, but he hadn't been. There's a small part of him that's angry with himself for never noticing or maybe never digging in is the better choice of words, because he'd known, he'd always known there was something off about Izuku in that quirk of his. It's irrational, he thinks, to be upset at the fact that he didn't help with something that he hadn't known about. It's irrational, but he can't help the pit forming in his stomach the longer he dwells on it and really picks the situation apart. There had been tells, as minuscule as they'd been. Frankly, that entire conversation with Izuku and Yagi had more or less blindsided him. He hadn't known what he was expecting when he'd caught the two whispering like school children in the infirmary, but it certainly wasn't anything like the actual truth of the situation. To learn of Izuku struggling alone, trying to learn a powerful, extremely dangerous quirk without proper training or counseling, to know that Izuku had been struggling with something so dangerous, and Shota hadn't had the faintest idea of what that actually entailed, just how dangerous superpower was. Maybe Yagi hadn't meant to isolate the teen, but at the end of the day, he had been. For almost a month between the moment Izuku used that quirk for the first time on the Zero Pointer, and when he finally found the courage to confide in Shota that second week of school had... It had almost been a month, a month of the kid learning on his own, through trial and error that often resulted in fractured limbs and shattered bones, a quirk too powerful to be contained in his body, despite the muscle Izuku had arrived at school with, and had just kept building as the year progressed, and hadn't Izuku said something about his quirk blowing off his limbs, or something if he'd manifested it too early? That thought alone has his stomach churning unpleasantly. Show declares down into his mug of steadily cooling coffee, Stomach too uneasy to even think about taking another sip. Still, he cups the warmth between his hands, even if the sight of the coffee makes him want to recoil. It really feels like a rug had been tugged out from under him, leaving him to flail as he tries to right his footings or catch himself, which feels impossible at the moment. He feels like an idiot, the longer he analyzes Suzuka's time in not just his class, but as his foster son as well. There really had been tells, if he'd just taken the time to look closer. He and Izashi had always had suspicions of All Might playing favorites, way prior to them actually taking the green-haired teenager on as a foster son. And Yagi had been blatantly interested in Izuku on that first day, hovering just out of sight as the 1A students competed in Shota's quirk assessment test. Shota had known there was something there, of course, but he never would have been able to guess that it would be something like a literal mentor-mentee relationship revolving around a newly transferred, stockpiling super quirk. He never would have thought it could have been because Yagi had known the kid for nearly a year before the entrance exams even took place. This was way worse than anything he thinks he could have surmised. Shota had decided that same night after he'd made sure Zuko was tucked away asleep in his bedroom in the apartment. 
Shoda, for one of the first times in his life, hadn't been able to quiet his thoughts and find the same fate as the exhausted teenager, something about knowing that irks Shoda. Even thinking about it now, Yagi should have told them, or told Shoda in the least. He was the adult in the situation, and Izuku is still a minor. The Inazashi are pros, teachers, and the boys' guardians. They know secrets and have worked under intense confidentiality agreements, but he knows Yagi hadn't even considered saying a single word about any of it, even if it would have made Izuku's integration with such a powerful quirk that was entirely new to him less traumatic, even just a little bit. Shota's just glad that Izuku had sought him out, all those months ago at the start of the school year, confiding in him that he was a late bloomer, and that he was scared of his new quirk, scared to hurt others and himself. Shota had known at the time that there were things that Izuku was edging around as he explained himself nervously, and Shota will admit that he hadn't really understood then, as hard as he had tried to help Izuku along and teach him to control his quirk, and to be comfortable in his own skin handling something so powerful. It went far. Far deeper than that, though, didn't it? The more he thinks about that day now, the conversation that Izuku had prompted, the prouder he is of the kid. That must have been terrifying. Shota knows Yagi probably wouldn't have been on board at that point, and even from just hearing how the man had been whispering about secrecy that afternoon when Shota had caught him at Izuku's bedside in the infirmary, he knows how his kid idolizes Yagi. Izuku would never want to hurt or betray him. Shota can only imagine the inner turmoil that had the kid hovering outside of his classroom door that day after school. He thought it was odd back then, but now it makes complete sense how hesitant Izuku had been. How he skirted around topics and thought awfully hard about what he wanted to say, which wasn't typically a trait high school kids had. Shota suspects Izuku had told him about being a late bloomer behind the number one hero's back. Izuku had made the decision to reach out when he needed help, even if it was just the bare minimum that he could ask for without raising suspicion or betraying the trust that All Might was offering. He'd still reached out, and he'd reached out to Shota. Shota can only imagine what his kid had been through when it comes to that dangerous stockpiling quirk that will apparently be additional quirks as well. God, he's really not prepared for Izuku to manifest five more quirks for his kid to possess seven quirks. He still can't wrap his brain around that one. The door to the apartment clicks unlocked, and for a moment Shota thinks that maybe it's Izuku coming upstairs. He glances quickly at the digital clock on the microwave, before determining that Izuku would be long gone in his dorm. He'd been exhausted. Despite the incident at training happening three days prior, Shota had him on strict rules of no training and light activity, but thankfully all Izuku really wanted to do was sleep off the exhaustion and exertion. Shuzenji had dropped by the apartment each afternoon to check in on him, if only to make sure the teenager wasn't sneaking around and training or overworking himself. Shota would almost be offended at her lack of trust in him, but then again, Izuku is a wild card who has very little self-preservation skills, and Shota wouldn't put it past the teen to disregard them and keep practicing. Izuku had spent those first two days after that exercise, and the draining conversation, sleeping off the worst of the pesky fever that refused to break, Shota was just happy that the physical sickness of quirk exhaustion had worn off that first day of bed rest. Shota had never been gladder that they'd had the forethought to plan the battles for a Friday, giving the kids at least some recuperation time after facing new quirks and pushing their own abilities. By the time Monday had rolled around, just that morning, Izuku's fever was nearly broken, so Shota had permitted him to go to classes, so long as he didn't use any of his quirks until the fever was gone. He'd even forbade the kid from trying to use the new quirk until Shota had a chance to work with him on it, without his peers around. Shota hears something heavy hit the floor, a bag perhaps, and then there's the sound of keys being set on the storage cupboard that they have in their genkin, and there's a light bump of leather boots being towed up against the wall, and then light footsteps are easing into the apartment. Shota remains silent, staring at the doorway for his husband to appear. Izashi rounds the corner, blinking in surprise. I didn't expect to see you up, babe. Hizashi cocks his head faintly, now eyeing the coffee Shota still clutching distastefully. You okay? Is it wrong for a man to stay up to greet his husband? Shota's lips pucker, heart thumping anxiously, yet in annoyance at Hizashi reading him like an open book within seconds of being in the same room as him. Why do you assume something's wrong? No, nothing wrong with it at all, Hizashi hums, arms crossing over his chest as he eases into the room. Just I know you struggle staying up to greet me, as hard as you try, and I didn't assume anything. I asked if you were okay. Two totally different things, sweetheart. Hizashi hesitates, arms uncrossing as a worried frown curls onto his lips. He regards Shota calmly, finally bringing himself toward the table. But that response has me thinking something may actually be wrong. 
Shota hadn't really told Izashi much. The man knew Izukud overworked himself and had been in the infirmary with a rather serious case of quirk exhaustion, but that was really just the tip of the iceberg. Hizashi simply didn't need the extra stress while already on a mission, on the other side of the country. Shota knows that Hizashi's focus needs to be on that mission. There's simply no point in adding more worry onto Hizashi's plate when the conversation can wait until he's home and can safely give it his full attention. Not to mention, Shota knows how hung up on their foster son the man is, and he knows once he breaks the news, Hizashi won't be able to stop thinking about Izuku and this quirk that he's got. He'll probably feel just as guilty as Shota himself for never noticing. They really think too much alike for their own good. Izashi wouldn't be able to turn off the parental worry and focus on what's going on there, and that's dangerous when he's out in the field. His focus needs to be on the mission at hand, and not what's going on at home. Shota knows better than to put Hizashi into a situation like that. They'd learned early on, in both their relationship as well as their hero careers, that if it's not time-sensitive, or a life-or-death situation, it's not worth distracting the other while they're at work. And this, as surprising and upsetting as it is to learn their kid had been keeping such a huge, potentially dangerous secret under the insistence of the former number one hero, simply as neither of those things as much as Shota wishes they were. Izuku had had this unimaginable quirk since before they'd met him, technically, and sure, the thought of these new manifestations is worrying, but as of now, it's simply one new quirk that they'll be working with. Hopefully he'll have a better handle of it before he manifests another, but there's really nothing they can do about it, whether Hizashi's here or not. Babe? Shota looks up from his coffee, realizing slowly that he'd been too quiet. A cat brushes up against his ankle, and his coffee is now just a cool mug cradled between his hands. Shota, you're worrying me. We... Shota draws his eyes away from the worried blonde, fingers tightening on the mug. We need to talk, Izashi. It's important. Okay. Izashi hesitates as an emotion Shota can't quite play settles into his expression until finally... Is this a you want a divorce we need to talk, or an I forgot to do the laundry and you're upset about it we need to talk? Also, just for the record, if you do want a divorce, I am totally fighting you for custody of our son and the cats. I'm open to joint custody. Shota snorts a laugh of surprise, despite the gravity of the situation. No, I don't want a divorce. I'd never even consider dating anyone else, so you're safe on that front. Only you could wear me down, and now you're stuck with me. Till death do us part, remember? You're spiraling, Hizashi. It's nothing of the sort. Yeah, well, you're scaring me, Hizashi retorts anxiously, hands lacing together on the tabletop as he regards Shota. Not exactly what you want to hear from your husband when you get home after almost a week away, and totally not the way to ease into what I assume is a serious conversation, sweetheart. I almost had a heart attack. What's this about, then? Izashi pauses, staring at Shota for a long second before he draws in a breath. Wait. Izuku was sick. You told me he overworked himself. Quirk exhaustion, right? Poor little guy, just... This have something to do with that. Where is the little listener, anyways, up here? It does involve Izuku. Shota nods slowly, unsure what else to say. He's not here. He was finally well enough to sleep downstairs again tonight, and as far as I know, he's already asleep. The exhaustion hit him hard. His fever hardly broke since that evening he had spent in the nurse's office. Today was the first day that he was well enough to be up and moving, insisted on going to his classes. Sounds like him. Izashi huffs fondly before sobering up to the seriousness. What involves Izuku if it's not him overusing his quirk again? Did something else happen? I thought he was past the point of overworking himself and breaking himself when it came to his quirk. He's been so good with his quirk control. At this, Shota hesitates. How are you supposed to ease someone into someone, your child, manifesting a second quirk? That doesn't happen. You're born with a quirk, sometimes very rarely two quirks like Todoroki, but... Up and manifesting an entirely different quirk when you're 16 years old is practically impossible. Shota, Hizashi warns, voice tight in that scolding sort of way. You better not be figuring out how to sugarcoat something for me. I'm a grown-up. I can handle whatever it is you have to tell me, especially when it involves our child. Shota frowns deeply at being caught, sighing heavily as he slumps back against the backrest of his chair. Hizashi, he manifested another quirk. He... Hizashi cuts himself off, mouth agape as he seems to be processing that. Shota feels a little bad starting the conversation the moment Hizashi got home, but then again Hizashi hadn't really given him much of a choice. He what? That's why he got so sick. Shota carries on, head bowing down. 
he manifested a new quirk, completely different from his original quirk, that he didn't know how to handle. It was a quirk accident. That's the truth of it. Luckily, no one was hurt. He did a good job keeping it contained and protecting the other students. He then proceeded to use both his new quirk and the original one's superpower, and I suppose that he overused both when not prioritizing one over the other. You've seen how emitters manifest. It, it wasn't pretty. Hizashi says nothing for a long second, and Shota just knows the cogs are turning in his husband's head as he finally tries to process everything that he'd just been told. Finally, Hizashi lets out a shaky breath, eyes staring intently at Shota's face. How is that even possible? He manifested a second quirk? Now? Shota bobs his head in a nod, worrying his bottom lip between his teeth. What else? Hizashi asks quietly. Shota lifts his eyes, unsurprised to find lime green staring right back at him. You're nervous still. Hizashi analyzes with narrowed precision, still able to read Shota with ease. It's something the dark-haired man both loves and loathes about Hizashi. Don't bite your lip like that. You'll split it. Just tell me the truth, Sho. You... Shota shakes his head. This is going to be a long conversation. Go get changed and have a shower. I know how much you hate sitting around in clothes that you've traveled in. I'll make us something to drink. I could use some green tea. Does that work for you? Hizashi frowns hard, eyes narrowed as if studying Shota down to his soul. This really must be serious if you're offering to drink tea instead of coffee. The man muses, but there's not an ounce of humor found in his words, despite the words themselves being an attempt at a soothing humor. Green tea is fine. I'll be right back. Hizashi stands slowly, disappearing into the Genkin first, to grab his bag before heading down the hall toward their bedroom. Shota stands, mug in hand, as he makes his way to the counter. He sets his coffee mug in the sink and then selects everything he needs to make the tea as he listens to the shower turning on. Hizashi really isn't wasting any time. It's always hit or miss when the blonde enters the bathroom. Sometimes, most of the time, he takes his time. He can shower for hours, and sometimes spends ample time perfecting his hair in the morning, does skin care things, and spends more time shaving and grooming his facial hair than Shota thinks is really necessary, but he's also able to almost flip a switch and be able to shower and be ready in a matter of minutes if need be. Shota sighs, knowing it'll be just minutes before Hizashi is back. He really doesn't want to be having this conversation, but he knows Hizashi deserves to know. Izuku is just as much Hizashi's kid as he is Shota's, and the fact that their child possesses an age-old transferable quirk that has been passed down a line of heroes, all trying to defeat one singular A-tier villain, who they haven't even realized existed, was something that he should know about, too. Not to mention there was a very good chance Izuku would be manifesting more quirks, at least five more, if the teen is correct, which would bring his grand total of quirks to a breathtakingly impossible seven. You're thinking pretty hard about something, Hizashi accuses softly. Shota jumps in surprise, caught off guard, which just makes his husband frown harder when Shota spins on his heels to face the other man. The kettle boils behind him, but he's a bit busy trying to calm the racing of his heart at being snuck up on. The blonde is right back at the kitchen table, showered and dressed in pajama pants and a hoodie that Shota thinks might belong to him. His hair is still wet, half-heartedly towel-dried, but pulled up into a messy bun. His regular prescription glasses sit at the bridge of his nose, and there's wrinkles between his eyebrows from how furrowed his expression is. Shota swallows, turning back to the counter. Sorry. Hizashi says nothing as Shota goes about making their teas. He wishes he was preparing himself another coffee, but even he knows it's too late for that. If he wants to get some sleep and be ready for classes in the morning, as is, he's already afraid that he and Izuku will be butting heads about training if the boy still has any remnants of his fever lingering. Shota turns swiftly to the table, holding two steaming mugs. Thank you. Hizashi chews the inside of his cheek as Shota sets the mug down, the blonde not wasting a second before wrapping his hands around the ceramic. Shota follows suit, distracting himself with the heat soaking into his calloused hands. Shota opens his mouth, but he doesn't know what to say, how to lead into this. He knows it's going to upset Hizashi. He knows Hizashi's going to be worried and scared and pissed off. Hizashi respects Yagi. Shota thinks they all do, after the man had played such a huge role in protecting not just Japan, but America and a handful of other countries that he toured. Hizashi respects Yagi, but all that will go out the window when he hears what happened. Yagi's carelessness when it comes to passing on this dangerously valuable quirk to a child that hadn't even made it to high school yet. Yagi deciding that a 14-year-old boy was a good candidate to inherit something so powerful, so dangerous. Shota himself had been livid, 
when everything had come to light, and he knows if Izuko hadn't been in the room too, he might not have been able to control himself as well as he had. Maybe it wouldn't feel quite like this if they didn't have such a personal connection to Izuku, if they were just teachers figuring out the truth about a student in their classes, but they do have that connection, and if no one else is going to be upset that Izuku was put in a position like this, making life-altering decisions at just 14 without anyone to run things through, Shota and Hizashi will. And it's really not Yagi's fault, not entirely at least. He was an idiot, no question about that, in the way that he did things, but Izuku simply didn't have anyone in his corner before meeting the man. He was a quirkless child, who no doubt faced discrimination. He was isolated for being different, belittled. And Shota knows this just from how Bakugo had regarded the green-haired teen that first day of school, which makes a lot more sense now that he has all the information. It was unfortunate circumstances that made this messy. Izuku was essentially on his own when he'd met All Might. No one helped him reason the pros and cons of accepting a quirk from a man who was the number one hero, but was also a stranger to Izuku, or to help him think logically about the dangers he'd be accepting, or to even just bounce thoughts off of, in an attempt to understand the seriousness of what was being offered. To a 14-year-old who had nothing, Yagi had offered Izuku all of his dreams tied up in a neat bow. Yagi couldn't have known that. The man hadn't known about Izuku's mother until the teen had told him that day after Shota had found him, living on the streets. At the end of the day, Yagi simply offered him something, and Izuku took it. I haven't seen you like this in a long time, Sho. Hizashi is the one to break the silence they'd settled into. He's frowning, looking so concerned that Shota really isn't sure how to process it. Shota sighs, hands lifting off the mug to drag down his face. He breathes out another sigh into his palms before dropping his hands onto the table. I don't know how to tell you. Shota finds himself saying carefully. I don't know how you'll react. Hizashi watches him for a moment before shaking his head. This has something to do with Izuku, right? This this new quirk of his just... Start there. What happened? That was logical. Shota could do that. It manifested suddenly. Shota tells him quietly. Well, I suppose it manifested out of him. Tendrils of... of quirk. Energy. Maybe. It was horrifying, Hizashi. He had no control, but it... That quirk was rampant flung him around in the air and crashed into pipes, nearly hit some of the other students in the exercise, he was completely at its mercy, and he looked so scared. Izashi draws in a shaky breath, nodding slightly. Did you stop it? I didn't. Shota shakes his head. By the time I got to them, Izuku was waking up and the quirk was already neutralized. I talked to Itoshi and Uraraka after Izuku was with Shuzenji. Itoshi said he'd managed to get Izuku under brainwash and the quirk just disappeared when Izuku wasn't in control anymore. Izuku was out even after Hitoshi had released him, and when he when he got up, he could control the quirk better. Brad used it during his fight, along with that power quirk of his, and it's no wonder that he passed out from exhaustion. So a lot happened, Hizashi says softly. He really has two quirks now. That's just the beginning. Shota snorts humorlessly. I don't want to upset you. I know how you are, especially when it comes to Izuku. It's a lot, Izashi, and you can't... We can't change this. We're simply being informed, and that's... That's it. That's all there is to it. No matter how angry or upset you are, this is... It's dangerous. You need to be aware of that before I say anything more. It involves Izuku, but you don't have to be involved, too. Upset me. Izashi levels him with a glance, staring seriously into Shota's eyes. Charcoal gray meeting lime green. I want to be a part of this if it involves him, Shota. We're equals, you know that. I don't care if it's dangerous. Upset me, please. Don't leave me in the dark. Shota bows his head in a nod, knowing this was exactly how this conversation would go. Izuku did not manifest his quirk in the traditional sense. Shota stares down into his tea as he speaks, only looking up to watch his husband as he continues. He doesn't have a quirk factor, or he didn't. I don't know how that changed, if it changed at all, but he wasn't born with a quirk, Izashi. He manifested his quirk so late because he didn't have a quirk to manifest any earlier. He wasn't. Izashi blinks owlishly. But he's got... I've seen... You've seen his quirk. How is that even possible, Shota? For a moment, Shota thinks about lying, but he can't do that to Izashi. He deserves to know. He deserves to be part of this and know about this just as much as Shota does. 
And in the end, Izuku deserves to have people who know, too, to not need to keep secrets and protect others, especially others who are supposed to be protecting him. This is a huge secret that the child had been harboring, and Shota understands the need for secrecy, doesn't like it, but understands it. Shigaraki and this all-for-one villain are dangerous, but secrets like these are draining to keep. Protecting loved ones by bottling things up, saying nothing to keep those you care about safe, not risking putting others in danger when you signed up for it. There's a villain. Shota starts quietly, unsure how he's going to explain all this. Starting at the beginning seems logical, though. That's where Yagi had started, isn't it? Back at the dawn of quirks, he manifested what could have possibly been the most powerful quirk known to man. A quirk that lets him take and... and give quirks at will. He was dangerous and beyond powerful. Why are you telling me this? Izashi asked softly, uncertainly, watching Shota with a sharp glance. The Dawn of Quirks was well over 200 years ago, Shota. How is this relevant to now, to Izuku? His name is all for one, Hisashi. When Hisashi sucks in a startled breath, Shota knows he's pieced it together. They'd all heard the name when the villain had been arrested, even if it hadn't meant anything to anyone else. Just another villain's name. Hadn't even really been covered in the media past the glimpses of the fight between the two that was scarcely recorded through the storm that day. That's who... Yagi just fought that villain, as Ashi stumbles his way through his thoughts. He was just arrested. Right after we got Izuku and Bakugo back from the League, he's still alive? He's been... for this long? How is that possible? Shota nods faintly. Yagi doesn't know how either. He thought... Alvaro was dead, up until recently. The last time they fought, it left them both critical. I assume Alvaro One must have stolen a quirk at some point that would keep him alive for so long. He's got... He's got a lot in his arsenal, Hisashi. He's dangerous. Yagi. Hisashi snaps the name out, eyes bright and distrustful. What does Yagi have to do with this? Why does his name keep coming up when it involves Izuku? I'll get to him, Shota promises softly. There's more to the story, and if you're going to understand, you need to hear it. I know you want all the answers instantly, but you need to understand the basics before we get to that. All right, Hisashi allows, swallowing down his anger. The blonde slumps back in his chair, fingers curling around his cooling drink to calm himself down. All right, I'm sorry. Keep going. Please, I want to know. All for one. Apparently I had a younger brother. Shota continues swiftly, trying to remember the important parts of the story that had been shared with him. A quirkless, sickly man from how the story went. He wasn't like all for one. He was opposed to the man and what he was doing. Didn't agree with it at all. All for one, he forced a quirk onto his brother. An energy stockpiling quirk, something his body could handle, I guess. Just, the brother did have a quirk. A dormant transference quirk. Yagi says the two quirks melded together and became what's now known to be a quirk called One for All. Wait, wait. An energy stockpiling quirk? Hisashi breathes out. Isn't that what Izuku describes his quirk as? And transference, what does that even mean? Like, like a quirk that can be passed along? That's insane. That's impossible, Shota. I know. Shota winces. But that doesn't mean that it isn't true. We know so little about quirks, even to this day. Didn't even know something so powerful could exist out there, let alone exist for 200 years without the public catching wind of it. A transferable quirk isn't so insane when considering that. So Izuku really... Hisashi swallows, reaching up to scratch at his hairline nervously. I don't know how to process this, Shota. He's just a kid. How did... How'd this happen? As far as I'm aware... Shota pauses, choosing his words carefully. One for All has been passed down from wielder to wielder over the years since All for One's brother had the quirk forced on him. It's gotten more powerful, with each to possess it. Yagi thinks it's the only thing that'll be able to stop All for One's quirk. Izuku's the ninth wielder, and Yagi... Yagi was the eighth. So Yagi gave our kid a super quirk. Essentially. Shota shrugs awkwardly. That about sums it up, actually. Like I said earlier, Hisashi, we can't change this. Izuku had this quirk before we even knew him. All we can do is support him and help him learn so he doesn't end up in the state he was learning one for all. He, there's a very strong chance he's going to be manifesting more quirks, the past wielder's quirks. That's what happened during the training. He manifested a new quirk called Black Whip. He doesn't need to be worried about us. He needs to know that we're going to support him. How, how many more? Hisashi hazards the question, looking like he doesn't really want an answer, but he needs to know despite that. 
Please don't tell me he's going to have nine quirks, or, uh, eight, I suppose, if Izuku didn't have one to begin with. Izuku thinks he's going to be getting seven. Shota doesn't beat around the bush. Seven total, but we have no idea what he could manifest. Yagi doesn't know much about the quirk. That's how much of a highly kept secret it is. The circle of knowledge is tiny, Hizashi. We're not going to get many answers here. Seven. Hizashi wheezes, dropping his head down to his hands. I know. Shota sighs, sharing the sentiment. Hizashi keeps his head down for a good second before he's finally lifting his attention up, expression still serious. How dangerous is this, Shota? How much danger is our kid in? And Shota can't lie about this. Can't stretch the truth to protect Hizashi. He needs to know so he can be prepared to protect Izuku and the students as well. Shota understands not telling all the teachers if this really is as sensitive and dangerous as it seems, but if they're lucky enough to be involved, confided in, they need to be prepared for when shit hits the fan. The two of them are a part of the select few who know now, and Shota will be damned if he doesn't give his all in protecting his kid and students. A lot, Hizashi. Shota finally says, voice quiet but serious. That's what I thought. The blonde sighs deeply, dry washing his face with his palms like he's trying to wrap his head around everything. Can we even protect him? If what you're saying is true, this is far bigger than us. This villain is... in the League. We've never been ahead. Have we? They're always two steps ahead of us, even when we have All Might on our team. We can only try. Shota shakes his head lightly. It had taken nearly three days for him to come to that conclusion, but that's really all they can do. They're not invincible. They can't place themselves on some pedestal when someone like All Might nearly died fighting this villain. At the end of the day, he and Izashi are only human. Humans who don't possess the quirk believed to be a match for all for one. We know now, Shota continues gently. We know to be prepared. We can help Izuku with these quirks, and God forbid he ever needs to use them against Shigaraki or all for one, we can ensure that he has the best chance at prevailing. Izuku is... He's a hero, Hisashi. We both know that. He might be young, but I think he knew exactly what he was getting himself into. I hate thinking about him getting hurt. Hisashi's voice is wobbly, like he's seconds away from crying. I hate thinking of him being the only one able to stop this. He's just a kid. He's our kid, Shota. He should be focused on hanging out with his friends and finding a girlfriend or a boyfriend or whatever the little listener wants, worrying about exams, not some kind of war he's the secret weapon in. Shota's heart breaks. He hates this, too. I know. Shota consoles quietly. I agree, but we can't change that. He's safe here for now. All for one was arrested and he's locked away in Tartarus. We need to make the best out of this for him. Izuku deserves that. We'll keep training him and helping him learn. He'll need all the help he can get. He's part of this, and I don't know about you, but I'm going to give him the best odds possible. Jerk. Hizashi sniffles, a light smile tilting onto his lips. You know I will, too. I love him. I'll do anything in my power to keep him safe, just like you, you dig? Just making sure. Shota shrugs, offering a soft little smile to his husband. There's no point in getting hung up on this, and Shota thinks Hizashi has realized that as well. It's not something that they can change, and neither of them are about to treat Izuku as anything more than a student and their kid. He's not some war machine. He's a child, and they'll prioritize that while still making sure that he's getting the training that he needs to not end up a casualty. They settle into a second of content silence, each just taking a moment to process everything. Hizashi slumped back in his chair, hands still cupped around his mug, with his head lulled back and his eyes shut. Wall Shota is slumped forward now, the weight of his upper body supported by his elbows, and his fingers loosely hooked around the handle of his mug. Welcome home, by the way. Shota clears his throat lightly, drawing Hizashi's gaze back down to him. We missed you, Izuku and I. It's too quiet without you here. The blonde's lips curl into another smile, just maybe a little huffy now. Thanks, babe. Hizashi snorts out good-naturedly. Shota knows he's a bit late on that one, but... He wanted to get the serious talk out of the way first. Izashi wilts a little, softening slightly. I missed you both as well. I was so ready to come home. I can't wait to hug the little listener tomorrow, especially after all this. I wish he was up in his room in the apartment. I really just want to make sure he's okay, you know? He's okay, Shota assures. He was a bit fevered when I sent him downstairs after dinner, but I'm hopeful that it'll be gone by tomorrow morning. He's starting to go stir-crazy. He didn't hurt himself, it was just the exhaustion. Shizenji had cleared him, remember? She would have kept him if she deemed it necessary. 
Exhaustion is still serious. Hizashi reminds Nibali, sipping at his tea. Man, I do not want to see Izuku go through five more times of this. Manifestations are hard enough as is. I don't know what this will do to the poor kid's mind and body. We don't even know what he'll be getting. It's like the worst game of gotcha to exist. Hound Dog will be the next one, I inform. Shota promises because even if Yagi hadn't prioritized proper manifestation etiquette, Shota sure as hell will. Not the vital details, of course, but the chance that Izuku might be manifesting additional quirks, I doubt he'll ask any questions. He knows confidentiality well as a pro and a licensed counselor, and I honestly doubt anyone would be able to figure out Izuku had a transferable quirk that dates back to the dawn of quirks without additional information. That's illogical. That's insane. Izashi muses in agreement, but his lips turn downward slightly as he winces. Yeah, I doubt anyone could figure that one out. I'm glad, though, Izuku needs a professional quirk counselor. And training, of course, but you're obviously the best choice for that. Man, this'll be rough, won't it? It might be. Shota bows his head in a nod. If this first manifestation was anything to go off of, they really might be in for a ride. He's a strong kid, though. You should have seen how fast he managed to grasp at that quirk when it manifested. It's like he suddenly knew the secret of controlling it when he came to. I've never seen anything like it. He really is a remarkable kid, isn't he? Hizashi blows out fondly, sipping at his tea. He's something. Shota agrees lightly, hiding his own small smile behind the rim of his mug as he follows suit, sipping lukewarm tea. A problem child is more accurate. Stop it. Hizashi laughs, swatting playfully at Shota's forearm from across the table. I know you adore that kid. He's not just a problem child, he's your problem child. Just admit you love him already, grouchy pants. Shota doesn't reply, but he's well aware that his smile widens faintly behind his mug as his eyes soften in adoration of the thought of their kid. Izuku really does have him wrapped around his finger, doesn't he? He'd never gotten quite so attached to a foster child because he knew more often than not the kids placed with them were in passing, a couple nights, maybe a week if needed, but then they were gone again. But there was something different about Izuku. Somehow the child just fit with them. Shota had never pictured himself having a child, not when he was little or when he and Hizashi had gotten married, but now he can't seem to imagine their lives without the green-haired child. Dad. Izuku had called him Dad. Shota had almost forgotten. Maybe the kid was starting to feel the same way. What's got you smiling like that? Hizashi reaches across the table, finger-hooking over Shota's wrist, to pull his hand away from his mouth. Come on, Sho! He called me Dad. Shota confides softly, I staring down into his drink as his lips twitch into another smile, as Hizashi gasps in excitement. I'm not sure if he realized it, but he did. He did? Hisashi is positively grinning, beaming from cheek to cheek. That's amazing, sweetheart. I wish I could have heard it. I totally miss him calling us dad and papa, even if it was just the one time. Oh, man. I was so sure he'd call me papa first, but I guess Nem won this round. Never take a bet with her, Shota. It's like she's a witch or something. Bets are illogical anyways. Shota remarks in a scoff. Bets are fun, Izashi laughs. You're just a poor loser who can't bet right to save his life. Stop betting on our child. Shota shakes his head, still reveling in Izuku calling him dad to feel offended at the teasing jest from Hizashi. Like I said, I doubt he even knows he did it. I didn't mention it, and he didn't seem to realize. But he wasn't drugged up this time, Hizashi smiles knowingly. That's a step in the right direction. Gah, I love that little listener. He called you dad. That's the sweetest news I've ever gotten. I needed that after, well, everything else, you dig? I hope he calls me papa again soon. Shota's heart swells fondly. I really liked it, Izashi. I'm sure. The blonde smile softens, regarding Shota with such soft, fond eyes. You're a good dad, Shota. He just needs time. Hopefully soon he'll let himself think of us as his dads. He really needs people he trusts in his life, and... We're not going anywhere anytime soon, yeah? I hope he knows that. I'm not sure Izuku really trusts anyone, Shota finds himself saying, and it's also something he's thought a lot about. Every time he thinks they're making progress, it feels like the teenager finds a way to wall himself off. Izuku's always been a strange kid, there's no arguing that, but he'll live a lonely life if he doesn't start letting himself trust others. Shota understands the secrecy that came along with the knowledge of and possessing one for all, but now... Maybe now that they know, the kid will ease up a little. Shota had learned that the hard way, until he'd let Hisashi and Obero whisk him away into a life of friendship and near-constant companionship that he couldn't hide from if he tried. He wouldn't change it for anything. 
Yeah, Hizashi worries his bottom lip suddenly looking crestfallen. I know I worry about the little guy, too. At least he and Otoshi are pretty close, and he's getting more and more comfortable with us, too. It's not a sprint, it's a marathon. Shota nods. Izashi's right, of course. They need to pace themselves, they need to be here for the long run. Izuka's a child who'd been wronged all his life, left in isolation for reasons beyond him, abandoned, and left alone in ways a child should never be. They're finally finding more puzzle pieces, putting things together in a way that's starting to assemble like a picture. Honestly, it's no surprise he's so hesitant to let anyone in. Hey, Izashi calls after a long, thoughtful second. Do you... I don't know. I know you don't really believe in ghosts, but... What about guardian angels? Where's your stance on that? Guardian angels? Shota cocks his head to the side. What do you mean? I don't know. Izashi shrugged sheepishly, frowning down at his tea. Just... I like to think that maybe he's not as alone as we think he is. Doesn't he... I don't know, remind you of Obero a bit? Obero? Shota stills, hands tensing against the ceramic mug. He just reminds me of him, Hizashi breathes out. Some of the little things he does, and just... I don't know, how he is, I guess. Sometimes I just... I swear Obero's around, you know? Like, I know he's gone. He's been gone for... for a long time, but Izuka just feels so familiar... Sometimes I look at that kid, and I can't help but feel... Obro's around too, you dig? Shota's brow furrows as he processes that. You think Obro is... a guardian angel to Izuku? Maybe. Izashi shrugs a shoulder lightly. I know it's not, like, real or anything, and I know you're not spiritual at all, and... I'm not really either, but... I just... I think he would have really loved the kid if he were alive, you know? I think... he'd protect him. Maybe even for us. I just get this feeling sometimes. It's dumb, I guess, but I sort of like to believe Izuku has someone with him, watching over him, and there's no one I trust more than Obro to keep an eye on him. It's a nice thought, Shota allows himself to admit. Where's this coming from, though? I just can't help but think, Izashi admits quietly. It's little things, really. Nothing significant until you put them all together, like, remember how I told you Izuku had ordered Obro's coffee order? Down to the weird special request of cinnamon and the chocolate croissant. It's not strange, as it is, but if you throw things like the USJ where you, you were so sure you'd seen him, Shota, so sure he was there with Izuka that day, I just, maybe he's watching over our kid for us, you know, keeping an eye on him when we can't? Shota swallows. He'd never found a logical explanation for seeing his dead school friend standing behind his very alive student. Not to this day. And there was simply no way to debunk that besides hiding behind the excuse of trauma and head injuries, but no matter how much he tried to tell himself it was impossible, he could never truly convince himself of it. He knows what he'd seen that day. And then there were other suspicious things, unimportant on their own, but when linked together to other things, Koda, for example, the young boy sobbing into Shota's shoulder about a guardian angel that had been with Izuku the night that Izuku had fought muscular in an attempt to defend the child, and even Eri, the odd things the little girl says about Izuku's friend, how her expression had lit up when Koda mentioned Izuku's guardian angel, when the two of them had met. They'd suddenly been on the same wavelength, leaving Shota standing cluelessly as the children beamed at one another knowingly. You can't just brush something like that off, not really. Then there was the streetlights incident, Something had led him right to the teenager that night. It's not like Izuku had been in plain sight, no. He'd been tucked away in the depth of a darkened alleyway, wedged out of sight between a wall and a dumpster. Shota had been led away from his route and directly to a poorly lit alley. Maybe it had been his eyes playing tricks on him, or maybe it was some sort of fate leading him right to a child who needed him, a guardian angel leading the way to their kid, who'd been just a student at the time. It takes a long second to process the thought that maybe he'd been guided to something that he and Hizashi needed that night. It wasn't entirely illogical. Shota thinks of everything the kid's been through, even just what Shota knows about since he'd met the kid, the sports festival, his homelessness, the Hosu incident, being beat within an inch of his life, and then kidnapped before he could receive any help or medical attention. Izuku had come out of everything alive, against all odds. Maybe he does have someone watching over him. It's not entirely illogical, Shota thinks, and even if it isn't, it's a nice thought. He knows Obero, knows that he'd find any way he could to help people, even if it was just watching over their child for them. 
That, Shota draws in an unsteady breath, refusing to look up. That does sound like something Obra would do. I don't know if I... That's irrational, Hisashi, but... You're right, it's a nice thought. I'd like to think he might be... Watching over Izuku, too. Yeah, Hisashi hums out softly. It really is. I like to think he's still hanging around. I really miss him. He just... He would have adored Izuku, you dig? I wish they could have met, but I'm happy with the thought that he's keeping an eye on our sunshine for us, you know? Makes me feel a bit better about all this. Shota bows his head in a nod, frowning lightly. It's a nice thought. The dark-haired man reiterates quietly. Shota still isn't the type of man to believe in such nonsense, but he can't argue the thought doesn't make his chest feel warm. If anyone needs someone watching over their shoulder and keeping an eye on them, it's definitely a problem child. It's just a bit of peace of mind. Even if it's just pretend. All right, everyone. This concludes Chapter 45 of UA Survival Guide. Chapter 46 will be next. Hope you all are still enjoying this one, and as always, thank you so much for listening.